Hi everyone and welcome to this uh, Crumble Intermediate video. In the beginner video we looked at um, sparkles, uh, motors using the built-in motor driver and some basic digital inputs and outputs, things that can be on or off. In this video, Crumble Intermediate, we're going to be looking at a few more advanced uh, peripherals. Um, we're going to use the servo and the ultrasonic sen distance sensor and the light sensor which we used in the beginner video uh, but this time we can use it as an analog input and we're going to do a bit of uh, maths in the software using some variables maybe do some special effects with the sparkles and try and do a bit slightly more complicated programs okay so first we're going to look at the ultrasonic distance sensor so this little device uh, fires out an ultrasonic sound wave and times the return trip uh, of the wave to give you an idea of distance to an object so you can see it's got four connections on this device uh, plus minus and an E and T which actually stand for echo and trigger and we need to connect both E and T to the crumble. Okay so first I'm just going to connect the battery pack up to the crumble as usual to give it power. Uh, so plus and minus from the battery pack um, to plus and minus on the crumble. Okay and then I'm going to connect power to the ultrasonic sensor. So I'm going to use another two, another black and red lead. So uh, plus and minus on the crumble to plus and minus on the sensor. And then I've got these pins E and T. So uh, they need to be connected separately to any of the four inputs A, B, C, and D, or inputs and outputs. So I will probably go to. Uh, let's go for A and B. So I'm going to connect A to echo and B to trigger. So everything's connected up so now we can start to look at the software. So the block we are interested in is in the input output menu and it's this block here distance in centimeters and then you've got these two labels T and E and we can specify where we've connected our ultrasonic two, and I can see if I remember T, uh, actually I connected to B, <laughs> and echo I connected to A, just to make things more interesting. Okay, so you can see this this kind of like rounded block uh, in the Crumble software. This represents a value, and um, so I can put this block uh, wherever you can see um, uh, a kind of a, a, a hole for it, really, and that means that accepts a value in the software. So what I'm going to do is start by making a variable called distance. Um, and we can use this variable to store the value uh, we get back from the sensor. So I can have a block. Uh, let distance equals and the distance we get back from the block. And this is really useful rather than directly using this block in, um, like for example, an if statement, uh, because we can actually monitor the value of variables when we're running the software. So if I um, make a basic program loop, so program start, uh, do forever, and I put my let distance equals uh, distance from the block, and uh, we'll plug the crumble back in to the USB port, turn the battery pack on, and press run. And if I now go over to the variables tab, I can see that there's a value appearing next to the distance variable. And if I take my distance block, uh, distance sensor, I can point it down the table. You can see that's now reading 12, 11, move it closer, move it further away. And we're getting a, a real time value there of the distance in centimeters from the sensor to the nearest object. The maximum distance it can measure is about three, well, about 3.7 meters. Uh, anything beyond that, it's just gonna read the maximum, uh, but anything less, you can get a reasonably accurate value. Uh, so this is really useful for obstacle avoidance or object detection um, when you're making projects. Okay, so that seemed to work really well. So now what we can do is use that value to do something in our program. So I've got a, a buzzer here, the same buzzer we used in the beginner video, and we're going to connect it to the crumble in exactly the same way, and but use the value from the distance sensor to decide when to sound the buzzer. Uh, so first, uh, we're gonna connect um, the negative side of the buzzer um, to a negative terminal. So I'm going to go straight to the battery pack 
and then we'll connect the positive side to output C on the crumble. And we can use the set C high command then to turn the buzzer on. Uh, so that's connected. Um, I can do a quick test. I can uh, drag my program over there. Let's get set C high block there. We can just run it. Yep, that's definitely working. Okay, so now within our main loop, uh, after we get the value for the distance and put it in a variable, we can then use that. So uh, if I go into control and put an if else statement in there, uh, we can uh, go into operations and we can see here we've got all these maths operations. And we've got uh, an operation here which is more than and less than. So we can check to see if the value of distance is more than or less than either another variable or a fixed number. So let's drag a less than block in. So we can say if the distance is less than 15 centimeters, uh, then we'll turn the buzzer on. Um, else we can turn it off. And I can, what I can do is I can right click duplicate on that, speed things up, and turn the buzzer off is set C low. So we've got this if statement that's constantly gonna be running. So this loop will be going around and around many, many times a second read the distance, check the value, and then turn the buzzer on or off. So if we click play now, that says it's successful. So I pick up my distance sensor, I'm gonna point it at the table. Oh, so there we go. So it's at 19 centimeters down, and then as soon as it gets below, we can hear the buzzer. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the program. Um, now what we can do, we can use the because we can use the variables and maths, we can do something even more complicated, and maybe we can get the buzzer to uh, pulse on and off at different rates depending on the distance to the object, a bit like a parking sensor on a car. So we've got our program that sounds the buzzer uh, at distances less than 15 centimeters. So for our parking sensor, we might want to start um, beeping maybe a bit further away, maybe 50 centimeters. So I'll change that to 50. Um, you can see here we've got a turn the buzzer off for any distances greater than 50, that in, in other words. We can leave that in there, that's fine. But in this block here, we might want to replace this with something that uh, beeps for a short period. So turn the buzzer on, that's fine. Now we can wait a certain amount of time, and then we can turn the buzzer off. Uh, turn, set a low, C low, rather. And then we'll put another weight in there. And what this will do is if it if the distance is less than 50, every time it goes around this loop, it will beep for a short period and then turn off a short period and then go back round. So if I play this now, let's check what our distance value is. Okay, so at maximum. So if I point this down at the table, we can see we go less than 50 and it starts to beep. Now the frequency of beeping doesn't actually change at all. So we want to modify that now to see if we can use the value of distance to change the delay we've got in our beep. So what we can do is in here, we can put basically the distance value. Now we're gonna to need to modify that slightly because if I put it straight in there, it might be a bit quick. We could try that actually. So we can go, wait distance seconds, and wait distance for well, milliseconds rather. Um, let's play that and we can see how that sounds. So you can just about hear it's getting faster and slower, but it's a bit too quick for our purposes. So this is where we can use the multiply block to scale that value up. So we'll drag that in and we can say distance times, let's try 10. Um, and then I can actually, if I get rid of that, I can right click and duplicate that. And put that in there. Press play again. Okay, so it's already beeping. Let's see what, what we're, at. we're at, 30 centimeters. Okay, so I go maximum distance, beeping stops. Let's try about 50. Okay, 36, 32. As I get closer, and I'm gonna crash my car. Yep, that works really well. Okay, so you can see there, by using um, some basic maths in the software, we've been able to create something a bit more interactive and a bit more complicated. Um, 
and we can move on now to using uh, an analog input uh, with a light sensor. Okay, so next we're going to look at analog inputs. So the Crumble has uh, four inputs and outputs, A, B, C and D, and we've used those digitally um, up until now. Um, what we can do is actually read a voltage in between completely off and completely on, and the Crumble will convert that to a number between 0 and 255 in Q2. Uh, and then we can use that to, for example, with a light sensor, get an idea of how bright or dark it is, rather than whether it's just day or night. Uh, so we're going to connect the light sensor up in exactly the same way as we did when we used it just as a simple on or off input. Uh, so first we're going to need to connect um, our battery pack again. So we go negative from the battery pack to negative on the crumble and positive to positive. And that gives power to the crumble. Uh, and then we're going to we'll connect our light sensor on the other side just for neatness. So I've got the plus and minus on there, so I'm going to connect the uh, positive to positive. And I'll use a green wire to connect the other side to C. So now we can turn to the software. Uh, so similar to the distance sensor, we can read the analog value and put it in a variable or store it in a variable. So if I go into the input output menu, we've got this block here called analog. And we can do a very similar thing. We can change this to analog C as we've connected our light sensor to C. And then I can create a new variable or I'll rename my distance variable the light level. And let's drag these blocks on so I can say let light level equal analog C. We'll place that in a do forever loop so it's going to constantly be reading the value of analog C and placing that in the variable light level. Add a program start block, and let's press program. If I go across to my variables tab, I can see this number here. So currently 170. If I start to cover up the light sensor, it goes down right down to single digits. And if I shine, I don't know if I can shine more light on it. <laughs> The whole room light gives it a value of 170. So instead of being on or off, you can actually get an idea of um, levels in between. You can use any input device that will vary in resistance and allow more current to flow into the input and change the analog level. For example, uh, LDRs, you can use potentiometers. Uh, you can even use your skin as a conductor. So if I grab um, the two terminals and squeeze harder, you can see the value of analog C going up and down. Uh, you can use them as moisture sensors, uh, water level detectors, anything like that. Okay, so as well as using a variable to store a value, we can actually just completely use it as a mathematical um, helper, and we can have loops that maybe make uh, colors fade in and out. So we could do a quick experiment here. We've got a batch box already connected, I've got a sparkle here which will connect and we'll see if we can make it fade in and out a bit like a, a, a heartbeat on an electronic piece of equipment. So I'll connect my sparker back up um, by connecting plus and minus and uh, a data line, D for data, making sure the arrow is pointing away from the crumble, as always. Um, and if I turn to the software, let's quickly do a test program, make sure it's working. So we've got set sparkle zero to red. I run the program and I've got my red glowing sparkle. So everything's good there. So let's see if we can do a simple uh, fade in and out program. So if I go to the control menu, um, I can use this loop here and do number of times. So it says 10 at the minute, but I can maybe change this to 100. And we're going to start get a variable as before, and we'll just use one of the built in ones. So we're going to say let x equals zero to begin with. And then I can put my set sparkle command inside the loop. Well, I don't want that one. I want uh, this one here. So this sparkle command, instead of choosing a color in the software, I can actually specify it with three numbers that represent the amount of red, green and blue that the sparkle will light up in. And these will take a variable. So I can put the variable x in, for example, green. 
And then after we do that, I can increase the value of x by 1. So what this program should do is it should fade up from off to a fairly bright green and then stop. So let's just check that works. OK, so it did do that, but it did it extremely quickly. So we need to put a wait command in our loop to slow things down a little bit. So let's put uh, wait, we try 10 milliseconds. That should take about a second to fade up because 10 milliseconds times 100 is one second. So let's try that again. Now I'll just click stop and sparkle off and click play. There, that was quite nice. Brilliant. So now we fade it up, uh, we want to fade it back down. So we'll use another loop. I can duplicate this whole loop. Instead of increasing x by one, we now want to decrease it. So I can move this out of the loop, uh, add a decrease block in, borrow these commands again. Okay, so this should fade it all the way back down to zero because it's doing it the same number of times. If I put that whole program in a loop forever, we should be able to have a repeating fade. And there we go. We could get more creative, uh, add different colours in, we could have different variables and fade between different colours. Um, but that's the basic principle of doing fades with sparkles. Uh, another thing we can do is we can add some interesting behavior to programs using the random block. So in the operators menu, uh, you can see here right at the bottom, we've got a random number generator. Uh, and this can be great by adding random weights or random brightnesses, um, anything like that. So we're going to use this to try and create a flickering flame effect with our sparkle. So if I go back to... Uh, menu so I add a program start block and we want to loop and then I'm going to use the set sparkle block again and we'll say we'll set sparkle zero to have a random amount of red between zero and well actually between 32 and 128 uh, so it doesn't ever go completely off but it flickers between brightnesses and let's also have a weight block and to make this a bit more realistic, we're going to wait a random number of time as well. So we'll wait between 10 and 20 milliseconds. OK, so everything's connected. If we run this program, we start to get a kind of flickering effect. Not quite a flame yet. I think it's a bit too red. So if we want it to be a bit more yellowy orange, we need to add some... Uh, green in there as well because red mixed with green makes yellow so I can duplicate my random block and put that into the green area let's see what this looks like okay so it's a bit more realistic I can see hints of green in there now which is not great so what we might want to do is reduce the amount of green we put in not too bad maybe you change the wait command so it's a little bit slower okay I think that looks a little bit more flame like okay so you could obviously refine that a bit maybe add some more sparkles and um, but that gives you the basic idea of controlling um, the sparkle LEDs using variables in the program okay so now we're going to move on to a new output device uh, this is a servo motor uh, it's slightly different to a normal geared motor or normal DC motor in that it doesn't continuously rotate uh, we can use the software to set the servo um, to be at different angles between minus 90 degrees and plus 90 degrees uh, so you can see there's a little adapter board on the bottom of the servo and um, that will allow us to connect it uh, more easily to the crumble uh, it's got a plus minus and an S for signal and that S can go to any A, B, C or D pins so we can have four servos connected to the crumble at one time so I'll first connect my servo up Plus and minus on the top of the crumble there, we'll go to plus and minus on the servo, and then we'll connect the signal line. I'm just going to go straight to output C. And then if we look at the software, 
Um, in the input output section, there is a couple of servo blocks. Um, we're going to use this one here. So servo A, B, C, or D, so in this case C, to a certain number of degrees. Uh, so let's do a quick test. I'll start my program. We'll immediately set the servo to zero degrees. Um, we'll need to wait then uh, for the servo to actually move there. Um, if you don't wait and try and set it to a different angle, it will just send those commands to the servo immediately and it will never get to the first angle. So we'll wait for a second and then we'll move the servo to a different angle, we'll say 90 degrees. Uh, right, let's run this program and see what the servo does. Okay, so it was already at zero, so it didn't go anywhere and then waited a second and then moved to 90. So let's try and put that in a loop so we get some repetitive motion. So I'm gonna put my servo blocks within a loop there. Now we'll see here what I said before about if you if you ac execute two servo commands in quick succession, it won't have a chance to move there. So as soon as it moves to 90, it's gonna go right back to the top of the loop and move that to zero. So we need to add another weight block in there. So I do that and press play Hopefully we should get a repeating motion. Yeah, so servos are really great for adding motion to um, uh, models like uh, animals or carnival activities, or um, we've got uh, an automated bin project um, which uses the ultrasonic uh, to detect the presence of a person and the servo to open the lid and then close it again after a few seconds. Um, and they're really easy to use. Okay, so we've covered quite a lot of ground there. Um, We've covered using variables to store data and affect outputs. Um, and we've covered the servo motor. Um, and those extra skills will enable you to do even more with the crumble and, and have more interesting projects rather than just stepping through a sequence of commands. They become interactive. Okay, well, thanks very much for watching this session. I hope that was really useful and hope to see you again soon.